I mean, that's why you get these criminals, man. You get criminals maybe say, say they make a big old score and, 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 and make a whole lot of money in, in a particular, uh, you know, robbery. But then they have to do it again. <laughs> and they do it again. And eventually they get, they get caught. See, I know, speaking to young people in juvenile detention, you know, sometimes they'd be sitting there, you know, Mr. Jarvis, Mr. Jarvis, I, I, I didn't do this thing and they got me on this thing, you know. And sometimes they're probably telling the truth. Probably, right? But what I would tell them is, is that maybe you didn't do this thing that you're locked up for, but how many things have you gotten away with and you, and, and, and you never got caught? I said, from a spiritual perspective, you're just suffering, although the court system is seeing themselves as punishing you for this particular act, which you're claiming you didn't do. But from a spiritual perspective, if you didn't happen to do this, you're just suffering right now for the things, some of the things you already did and thought you got away with. Okay? That's that temporary grace. You know what I'm saying? If, if, you know, you, you, you'd think that, that if a guy would make this big score, you know, stealing money or something, he'd just quit. But most of the time when you see criminals, they get arrested and, and, and they, they go to jail. You know, that, that a, a lot of times, just most of the time, it's probably not their first offense. Then because there is like this temporary grace. We get away with it the first time, most of the time. We'll probably get away with it the second time. We get away with it, but it becomes a point where we just keep doing it and keep doing it. And, and that's when we become uncovered. So that's the temporary grace. Now, in all this, all this that's transpiring, you are well with God because of that first kind of grace, the grace that was provided to us uh, by Jesus Christ at Calvary. That's the grace that makes us well with God. But we're still dealing with issues, uh, you know, amongst human beings. If you recall the story of that woman that was brought to Jesus in the act of adultery by the religious hypocrites, okay? And they were challenging Jesus. Okay, what do you do now? You say you're not here to break the law of Moses, but, but now here's this woman caught in the act of adultery. She's supposed to die. She's supposed to be executed. What do you say, Jesus? And Jesus responds to us, those that are among you without sin, you cast the first stone. And, and the scripture tells us that, that each of these gentlemen walked away from the oldest to the youngest, one by one, dropping their stones and walking away. And there was none left. And Jesus said to the woman, um, where are your accusers? And she said, there are none, my Lord. Jesus said, well, well then I don't accuse you either. And go. And sin no more, lest something worse happen to you. So what does that mean? So what I'm suggesting is Jesus didn't condemn her that time. And those gentlemen couldn't condemn her because, yes, the law was that, 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 that an individual caught in the act of adultery must be executed. That was the law, in fact. But as well, the law stated that, that the only folks that could throw these stones were, were folks that were not guilty of that particular sin. Now, Jesus came to clarify that, no, it's not about those who are not guilty of that particular sin. It's about those who are guilty of any sin at all. And in that case, no one has the right to participate in the execution. There's no one left. And Jesus wasn't going to condemn her. So when he tells her to go and sin no more, at least something worse happened to her. If, if it happened again, do you think Jesus would condemn her? No. Because, because that, that was not his function. His function was to bring us some freedom from the condemnation that's already hanging over our heads. So no, if it happened again, Jesus wouldn't condemn her. But he might not be there to save her next time. Okay? So that's the something worse. The something worse that might happen to her is the world that she's dealing with, she's going to have to deal with. She'll not be condemned by Jesus even if she comes back 70 times, 7 times. He'll never condemn her. But the, but the people, the hypocrisy of the people may not be held back by Jesus next time. She has to deal with the situation of her surroundings. So that's what I'm saying. We've got these two kinds of grace. You are well with God. Jesus will not condemn you. But you do have to deal with the natural world. The laws and the people in this natural world. And, and, and so we do reap what we sow. But I want to go even a step further even in talking about reaping what we're sowing. It's, it's, it's not really a bad thing. <laughs> Tell that to the person who's going through it. Tell that to the person who's suffering. Even, even like the pastor, you know, say that, that suffers through being uncovered and has to go through so much humiliation and, and, and maybe even the criminal court or, or whatever the, the ramifications, whatever the fallout. 
This, this individual might not feel that he's all that lucky. But what I'm suggesting today, just like a parent chastises a child, when, when you have a child, you chastise a child when they do wrong. You correct your child when they do wrong. And in a sense, you expose your child. No, you're not going to get away with that. And you have to be punished. You have to go through this. And why? Because I love you. And I want you to be well. As parents, we have a short time with our children. You know, I have a child in, in college, and, and I have a daughter who's five, and she's already like, you know, I don't have to hold her hand when I'm taking her to her kindergarten school, already becoming independent. And as parents, we recognize we have a short time with our children, and we want them to be well when they enter the real world. And so we spend our time trying to correct them, trying to teach them. We don't want to punish them. We don't want to spank them. We don't want to, you know, put them on restriction or take away their benefits. But, but we're trying our best to, to shape and to mold these little minds into being productive citizens and good citizens when they step out into the workforce at, say, 17, 18, 19, or 20 years old. And so it's in love. We were not supposed to be correcting our children when we're angry and, and hitting them or doing things to them out of anger. We're, doing, we're correcting them out of love. And what I'm suggesting today, it's the same with the Heavenly Father. When we're reading how the things that we do in secret you know, will be exposed, it, it's out of love. It's because the Father wants us to be well. The Father realizes that we reap what we sow. And we reap what we sow simply to get us on the right path so we'll be the people that we're supposed to be and, and, and functioning as we're supposed to be and being good to other people as we're supposed to be. You know, I was sitting in church today. And I was, I was thinking back on, on certain benchmarks in my life from the time I was as young as I can remember where, where, where people had treated me in such a way where I was somewhat offended and, and, and felt bad. You know how sometimes things follow you all of your life, even through adulthood, things that happen in your childhood? And I've always felt bad about those particular things. Maybe when I was in the sixth grade, I remember I had a buddy, and we were always cutting up, and we were always cutting up, and he was a white guy, and, and I'm black, and this was like back in the early 70s, and, and, he, and I would be punished, and he wouldn't be punished. There was some definite racism going on there, and, and that has offended me all of these years. But, but then I was thinking today as I was sitting back in church, you know, I was cutting up, and, and it wasn't fair that that buddy of mine was not corrected. But, but the truth was, I was cutting up, and I was correct. And it was like, I'm 50, I'll be 52 this year. And this happened in the sixth grade. And, and today, this morning, for the first time in all these years, I found a peace in that. Recognizing I was simply reaping what I was sowing. Now, they weren't being fair. And this, my friend got away with doing the same things I was doing. But that was between him and God. And that was between those people who were not really responding correctly to the both of us. That's between them and God. But for me personally, I did reap what I sowed. So I can look at it in a sense like I was being mistreated and singled out. But I began to look at it this morning like I began to learn lessons at an early age that you can't get away with doing wrong. However it was with the people that, that were used to teach me this lesson, as wrong as they might have been, or the young man that got away with the stuff that, that I didn't get away with, that's, that's their issue. But what I learned was that Martin, that, or Marty, that, that you can't do wrong and get away with it. And there were other situations that I don't even need to mention that I've never ever mentioned anyone and I won't mention here. But, but other similar situations. And as I looked at most of them sitting back today, it was like, man, well, I, I, it may have seemed unfair, but I did reap what I was sowing. And, and this time as well. Now, there were some other situations, certain racial incidences that happened in my life that, that I was totally innocent, totally a victim. But then I said, well, what lesson was I learning here? And instead of being hurt and harmful and, and continuing to carry all this baggage that I've carried all these years, I was released from the baggage this morning because I recognized, first of all, that, that I was taught a lesson at an early age and all through life that you do reap what you sow. I was also taught a lesson at an early age that, and all through life that certain things happen to you that are unfair. And that's just a reality as well. And, and so I was released believe, just this morning of so much baggage that I was carrying and, and, and especially realizing that I've always reaped what I've sown 
and, and, and there was no reason to carry baggage and being offended about it because it was really out of the love of God allowing us to see these particular truths. And I wish I had seen this truth a lot longer, a long time ago. Maybe my life, you know, would have been a lot different. But I like my life now. But just to recognize that, that, that chastising, that, that reaping what we're sowing, that, that are the ill deeds that we do and the ill words that we speak being uncovered and everyone knowing about it. This is correction because God loves us so much and we need to see that. So even when you have a pastor, say that's stepping out in extramarital affairs like some other pastors we've seen over the years or this pastor that's going through what he's going through and other pastors and ministers and all this stuff. Uh, if they've done it and they've been exposed, it's because God loves them that much that God doesn't want that to continue. And so to me, when we're looking at Scripture, how we hear about and we read about how the things that God once winked at, he's no longer winking at. I think the winking is that temporary grace that allows us to, to come to our senses and stop doing the things that we're doing. But when he's no longer winking, it's like the realization, well, they're just not going to learn to listen. They're not going to change. They have to be exposed because I love them too much to continue down this path. Okay, so, so we understand that aspect of it. Now, now, again, from the point of the perspective of the, of the past, pastor and his parishioners, parishioners, as we all have been parishioners, probably of pastors that have fallen into this and fallen into that, maybe not so devastating or not so serious, but just blind loyalty to the pastor is not helping the pastor because it's not recognizing the hand of God that corrects his loved one. It's, it's sort of like you, you have a, a friend and you're out in the world, you know, maybe a teenage or something, and they're doing something wrong, and, and they're, they're sort of getting away with it, and, and you're out there with them, and, and you're supporting them uh, not having to be chastised or not having to get caught or not having to go through the correction process. Uh, you are a, you're an accessory. <laughs> you're an enabler, whatever you want to call it. So, so even as believers, we need to recognize our pastors are not God. Our pastors are not Jesus. Our pastors are human beings as well. And when they fall into negativity, when they fall into doing things that they shouldn't be doing, in time when it becomes uncovered, it's not time for blind loyalty. That's not what they need. Now they do need a hand or a shoulder to cry on, possibly. But as far as some blind loyalty and denial and, and continuing to exalt this person in spite of whatever is going on, that's not helping them and it's not helping you either. And, and it's even we cross the line. One day we're, we're followers of God and one day we're followers of the enemy of God. Now, now because of grace, we're still well in the eyes of God, but we're not functioning in the will of God when we were enabling and supporting someone to, to sort of... Uh, to sort of stay clear of, of the hand and the correction of God. And so there comes a time we need to realize that, even as parishioners, that we're not helping by blind loyalty, even in the face of obvious, obvious uh, failures, okay? Now take it, we're going back to the pastor again, to the ministers again, and the, and the, um, and the responsibility to the parishioners. So I was, even as following this particular situation, I'm, I'm looking at the internet, I'm looking at all these people supporting the pastor or, or coming against the pastor. And, and it's like the pastor is center stage. The pastor is the person that, that, that all eyes are on. But what I want to suggest today is we need to, to recognize the victims, okay? The, say, say these folks are victims. Say they were used or manipulated. And, and I saw another person on the internet saying, well, these were not really children. Now, you know, they were, you know, in Georgia, 17 years old, I think, is considered an adult. That's all well and good. Whether they were 17, 20, or 30, if these folks were vulnerable because of the power of this man who was a man of God, what, what damage, what spiritual damage is being done to these young men, okay? And, and, and so, so these are the type of things we have to look at. The, the minister, the pastor himself, I'm sure, recognizes that he is well with God because of the righteousness that Jesus provided on Calvary. So, so as, as ill-filled as this pastor might be, or, or as negative or as evil and, and, 
as full of failures as he might be, he probably recognizes stronger than anyone else the reality of the grace of God that we receive through Jesus Christ that even in, on his worst manipulating uh, wicked days he's still right in the eyes of God simply because where sin does more abound grace abounds more as well he's well in the eyes of God